thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in what I consider my second academic home, <laughs> which is Berkeley. Uh, I hope we can formally make a commitment to have me back every year. <laughs> we were thinking of twice a year. <laughs> Uh, the narrative of Enrique Peña Nieto's government moving Mexico lasted less than two years. The triumphant headlines, the celebratory media coverage, the endless applause, the president who was going to save Mexico as the cover of Time magazine heralded, the team that would end the nightmare of paralysis and violence that had characterized the period of his two predecessors. That was the way many spoke, celebrated, endorsed, but it seems that the era of collective adulation has come to an end, as exemplified by the increasingly critical international coverage and the fact that Enrique Peña Nieto today has the lowest approval ratings of any Mexican president in the last 20 years. Today, the narrative is not about reforms, but about regression. It is not about Mexico moving forward, but about Mexico moving backward. It is not about the Mexican moment, but rather about the Mexican morass. Because of the assassination and, and attempted cover-up by the government of civilians in La Tlaya, the state of Mexico, because of the 43 allegedly incinerated students in Ayotzinapa, because of the conflict of interest cases that the government has denied or ignored, because the price of oil is dropping, the peso is devaluing, and the Peña Nieto government is faltering in its response to the crisis of confidence that Ayotzinapa erupted. The president seemed, in the days after, dumbstruck, paralyzed, without leadership, without proposals, without government decisions to defend or actions to carry out, without a cabinet that knew to explain what had happened in Guerrero or how to deal with it, without a team that could operate with efficiency, act with celerity, react with sensitivity or intelligence. Instead, what we saw was a government that knew how to market its image, but not how to defend it. A government that knew how to save Mexico by negotiating structural reforms, but not by preventing deaths. Along with the not surprising discovery that Mexico simply does not have a justice system that can investigate, identify, prosecute, rely on DNA samples, solve murders, or prevent them along with the revelations that the crimes were perpetrated by colluded policemen, homicidal municipal presidents, negligent governors, and a lethargic attorney general. In the extraordinary photograph that my friend Genaro Lozano took of the first march of 50,000 people protesting um, for the missing in Ayotzinapa, there was a huge sign in the center of the Zócalo, the main square in Mexico City, that said, Fue el Estado. It was the state. And so it was. A state that cannot protect, defend, investigate, punish, carry out its foundational mission. Instead, we saw government authorities that were as missing as the students they searched for. So after Ayotzinapa, the numbers added up to 43 plus one. And that additional one was the president of a country that could not pass the basic test of leadership as defined by John Kenneth Galbraith, the will to unequivocally confront the largest anxiety of his people. Peña Nieto did not confront that anxiety. He added to it. And now it seems that everything that was offered, promised, negotiated, agreed upon has not been enough. Not labor reform, not educational reform, not telecoms reform, not energy reform, not everything that was supposedly going to transform the economy, strengthen public finances, modernize the energy sector via private investment, 
everything that was going to propel us to the first world, to the group of emerging markets with high growth rates, to the same place that Carlos Salinas promised we would reach 30 years ago. So what happened? What went wrong? What occurred politically and economically? To begin with, the shocking disclosure of what many have known for years, that Mexico has become a country of clandestine graves, un país de fosas, a country where students are kidnapped by police forces and subsequently burned to death a country of bone fragments and charred remains, a country of 23,270 people who have disappeared since the drug war began. Years of corpses without a name, weeks of corpses without an identity, days of corpses that the government has no answer for, are constant absences that resonated little before Ayotzinapa. A singular case, but at the same time similar to the thousands that Mexico has lived with since the beginning of the war on drugs. Singular, because the government was forced to react due to pressure from below and from above, from civil society and from international scrutiny. A similar case, because the government reacted so badly. And that is why what the Mexican Attorney General has called the historic truth, la verdad histórica, that should lead to a case closed, is viewed as a government tactic designed to turn the page, overcome Ayotzinapa, forget the dead, move on to moving Mexico. Impossible to do so in the face of unanswered questions. Impossible to do so in the absence of a scientific consensus about what actually happened in that garbage dump in Cocula, where the students were allegedly incinerated. Impossible to do so in the light of inconsistent statements by those involved, many of whom were, um, had it, confessions extracted by torture. Also, because at five months after the incident, the Mexican government has not been able to detain all of the presumed guilty because the behavior of the military that fatal night has not been sufficiently investigated, because we still don't know what happened in the state of Guerrero in terms of political corruption at multiple levels that unleashed the violence that turned Iguala, and the government knew this from its own numbers years ago, Iguala had become the most violent municipality in the country. Also, how can we turn the page when the Argentine forensic team that was brought in to advise on the case has disputed the investigation presented by the Attorney General Jesus Murillo Caram, who became the catalyst for a worldwide hashtag movement called Ya Me Canse. I'm tired, as he declared in a press conference after too many questions from the press. Now, despite the specificities of the case, Ayotzinapa reveals a pattern. Ayotzinapa already occurred and continues to occur for thousands of Mexican families in search of a lost son, a kidnapped daughter, a father that no one can find. We are witnessing a perverse and ingrained pattern of forced disappearances that government officials do not investigate, of federal and state authorities that do not initiate criminal investigations, that do not assure justice, that do not provide reparations for the families. A perverse pattern of impunity that generates incentives for more kidnappings, for more people at risk a perverse pattern that stems from the absence of mechanisms, protocols, and resources to control a problem that we can no longer ignore. Documented by Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, by the United Nations, by dozens of Mexican human rights organizations, a history of debts and doubts, criminals and accomplices, broken hearts and broken lives, a history revealed and amplified by Ayotzinapa that has led thousands 
to march and mobilize and criticize and question. A dark history that, uh, that corruption has simply added another chapter to. And just as Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign team had a sign posted in its war room that stated, it's the economy, stupid, in order to keep the team focused on the key issue, Peña Nieto should do the same. But the sign should say, it's the corruption, stupid. <laughs> because an issue that used to be subsidiary has now become central. Because a topic that never seemed to impact the credibility of the government now does so. What is paralyzing, corralling, and pushing the Peña Nieto government into a corner is a theme that historically was considered normal and now is not. Government corruption then as a corrosive acid that runs through the reformist narrative, undermining its appeal, blocking, postponing, grinding to a halt what had been augured and might have been achieved. According to a poll conducted by Stephen Morris, 70% believe that everyone in the Mexican government is corrupt. Within the private sector, 39% admit that they need to make extra official payments to influence the content of laws, public policy, and regulation. Among internal auditors of the government, 60% recognize that they frequently encounter acts of corruption in the areas they supervise. Among the population, 62% responds that it has been necessary to pay a bribe to resolve the problem. Corruption is born and flourishes in official areas where decisions have to be made. The courts, the criminal justice system, bids for public concessions custom, among customs officials, and it is rarely denounced because 77% believe that it will never be sanctioned. All of this with increasingly onerous effects on the economy. Corruption is linked, as you probably know, to lower levels of GDP growth. It limits the benefits of commercial liberalization. It makes it harder to attract foreign investment. It generates a propensity for monetary crises to occur, produced by irresponsible financial and budgetary decisions. It deviates resources that should be channeled to public goods, such as schools and hospitals. Report after report on competitiveness in the Mexican economy uh, underscores that the main factor that affects doing business in Mexico today is corruption. A recent analysis uh, made public yesterday by the NGO Mexico Como Vamos suggests that corruption uh, costs the country 2% of GDP a year, and I think that that estimate is a conservative one. Corruption engenders a lack of confidence in public institutions, a lack of credibility in the government, a widespread dis disillusionment of Mexicans with their country and with themselves. And how has Peña Nieto responded to this crisis of confidence? Ineffectively underestimating or ignoring the problems its behavior has exacerbated. Because the White House ha scandal or the Malinalco House scandal, uh, the one in which the Minister of Finance, the person in charge of collecting taxes and assuring the absolute transparency on how public money is spent, got a loan from a contractor, the same one that built the house for the first lady, with a loan at a 5% interest rate, a non-banking loan, when market rates were 12% at the time. So these issues are defining for Mexico. And they don't have to do with whether the first lady was an extraordinary actress whose talent deserved a $10 million bonus from Tenerisa. They have to do with conflicts of interest between the government and its cronies, with the shady links between a powerful television network and public officials, with the way in which public concessions take place and how they are arbitrarily revoked. Uh, the concession for the high-speed train to Querétaro, 
uh, the day one day on Thursday of the same week that the White House scandal erupted, the Minister of Communications and Transportation came out and said that that bid had been virginal, transparent, um, imperfect, I mean perfect, impolute. And then the next day it was canceled because the government probably knew, given that it spies Carmen Aristegui, that she was coming out with a reportaje on the White House that linked that house to the same contractor who had just won the bid to build the train. So these scandals have to do with the way in which political and economic power is used and exercised and shared in Mexico in an irregular fashion, in an opaque fashion, in a discretionary fashion, without accountability. And the defensive, minimalist, and at times haughty reactions of the Peña Nieto government bring to mind a famous phrase incorrectly attributed to Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. It is a phrase that is used to criticize governments that are perceived as insensitive, frivolous, far removed from the legitimate indignation they decry, as the head of Peña Nieto's cabinet, Aurelio Nuño, did when he referred to the post-Ayotzinapa uh, demonstrations. He said in a derisive tone that the public plaza demanded blood and spectacle, when in truth it has been demanding justice and accountability. Him and other members of the administration that have not understood the dimensions of the crisis of confidence or how to overcome it. Because the PRI continues to believe, yes, that it's the corruption, stupid, but not as a demand for change, but as a way of governing. That's why, until yesterday, the PRI had blocked the approval of the national anti-corruption system that civil society had been pushing for. That is why the PRI really doesn't want an autonomous special prosecutor for corruption cases. And as a result of that historic recalcitrance, as researchers from Mexico Evalua have argued, Mexico carries a heavy burden of institutional frailty. The absence of a system of checks and balances that would allow institutions to pursue, process, and punish flagrant cases of corruption the absence of a system to combat conflicts of interest at the highest levels that would in include the Minister of Finance, the First Lady, or the President himself. That is the true scandal. And for far too long, Mexico's political class has abused and hidden and evaded scrutiny. For far too long, public officials have accumulated privileges as the article, Why Democracy Means More Corruption, by uh, Luis Carlos Ugalde in the recent issue of Nexos magazine, the argument seems, seems counterintuitive, but corruption has become more widespread since the democratic transition in 2000. Neither Vicente Fox nor Felipe Calderón considered combating corruption as a priority for their administrations. And as a, as a result, Mexico became a case that an implicit theory that more democracy means less corruption. The logic of democratic theory is that um, more democracy means more pluralism. Pluralism stimulates checks and balances in government. Pluralism is accompanied by greater citizen participation and as a result more people denounce corruption. But as the Mexican case suggests, Pluralism is not enough of a corrective for corruption. What is needed is not pluralism per se, but the existence of the rule of law. In order for pluralism to contain corruption, it must be accompanied by a culture of legality and solid institutions that guarantee justice. This does not happen in Mexico today. The table lacks legs. Electoral alternancia and pluralism uh, within a weak state invite abuse. The absence of checks and balances simply means that corruption has become more democratized as power becomes more decentralized. 
In the past, public money was controlled largely by the president and the executive branch. Today, it flows to the courts, to, the, to Congress, to political parties, to the media, where it is used to buy votes and power and influence. Corruption has been exported to the legislative and the judicial branch. Organizations that should act as counterweights to corruption have become its accomplices. The dispersion of power has opened up many more windows for private business with public goods. And as that abuse becomes more evident, the painful truth is that none of the institutional controls, internal, preventive, or corrective, put into place up to now, function as they should. The political class of all ideological stripes, including, yes, the PRD and Morena, have not allowed the existence of serious, objective, and independent investigations capable of determining whether there was a conflict of interest or not, whether a public bid was rigged or not, whether the First Lady bought the White House with legitimately earned and taxed income or not, whether the Minister of Finance, Luis Videgaray, in exchange for this non-banking loan um, that he obtained from a contractor, led that contractor to, mit, to win multiple bids for the construction of public works or not. And let's go back in time. Whether Raul Salinas de Gortari accumulated his vast fortune and his 49 properties and five apocryphal passports through influence peddling or not. President Peña Nieto has argued that corruption in Mexico is a cultural, not an institutional problem. I believe he is wrong. He is dead wrong. And the reverse is the case. Mexican citizens simply cannot count on an effective system to prevent or investigate or sanction corruption. And that is why it persists. That is why it grows. That is why it has become increasingly obvious and painfully lacerating. And therein, the importance of the anti-corruption system that is making its way through Congress, the importance that it be based on three pillars that are currently unknown to Mexicans. Clear limits on public power, absolute transparency regarding decisions, performance, and results wrought by government officials, and finally, sanctions that are effective and not politically biased. Now, what happened to Mexico economically that has led it to its current state of morass? As most um, economic analysts agree, the last two years have been disheartening. In 2013, Mexico fell into a hole that it has been unable to climb out of. It went from growing 3.9% in 2012 to 1.1% 1 .1 in 2013. It went from being one of the most dynamic economies at the global level to being one of the most downtrodden at the regional level. And the question for which there has not been a clear answer is why. Sometimes the global environment and the fall in oil prices is, is alluded to. Sometimes the unstable evolution of the American economy is the explanation that is given. Sometimes at the time that the implementation of the structural reforms in the Peña Nieto administration um, will need to kick in is used as the official explanation. Or perhaps, as economist Raul Feliz from CIDE has argued, the fundamental error might have been approving all of the reforms at once, without prioritizing, without placing emphasis on and political capital on the one that was the most important, the most urgent, the most necessary. And now that the one that the government believes will detonate economic growth, energy reform, has been approved, we will have to wait and see whether it fulfills the expectations it generated. The gamble is enormous. The government's administrative efficacy is poor. The regulatory challenges are immense. The possibility that the reform produces, as Luis Rubio has said, another cave of Ali Baba and his 50 thieves is real. The reform will take place in a context of bad governance, of high insecurity, of rules that are too flexible, of laws that are rarely obeyed, 
and that tied to the rapacity of rent seekers who view the energy se sector as a lucrative booty may produce results that are very different from the ones that were promised. Results where a privileged group of foreign and domestic investors win, but consumers end up losing. In the meantime, while the government waits for energy reform to resurrect the narrative of the Mexican moment, the government has not known how to deal with the collapse of the construction sector that dragged all of the economy down last year. It has not known how to deal with the delays in the channeling of public investment into infrastructure uh, in a Keynesian effort to get the economy growing. It has not known how to deal with the counterproductive effects of a fiscal reform that undermine growth by reducing consumption and internal demand. And therein, the paradox. The government has more resources, and the economy grows less. Time goes by, and Mexico is not moving. Because there's too much uncertainty about the price of oil and the parity of the Mexican peso vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, because the intentions of the government are not clear, because the reforms, yes, touch some of the vested interests in the economy, but not enough. And thus the questions, are the reforms, the much-touted reforms, a platform for growth, or will their implementation prevent it from happening? If the results don't become evident before the electoral cycles, will Peña Nieto recur to the old PRI practice based on the irresponsible and politically motivated practice of using public spending to buy time? There are no clear answers for these questions now. A recent issue of Forbes magazine put Peña Nieto on the cover, but not in the old triumphant, self-confident mode. It placed him with his head turned to one side with a worried, morose look on his face. And there are good reasons for that. What Enrique Peña Nieto and his team are probably thinking right now is that they just need to take cover, weather the storm, wait for the protests and marches and demonstrations to wane, wait for Mexicans to become tired of marching, um, hope that what has been announced and accomplished will be enough to assure some breathing room and political recovery. Focus attention on the good news that exports are up as the value of the peso goes down, that reforms eventually will spur growth, that telecoms reform and the arrival of AT&T to Mexico will improve the quality and price of broadband for Mexican consumers, that domestic and international investors will display an appetite to invest in Mexico's oil fields despite the collapse of the price in oil, the good news that the official statistics show that the number of homicides is decreasing. And I take issue with that, actually, because if you look at the numbers, as Alejandro Jope has done so very carefully, the number of homicides in Mexico, yes, indeed, has gone down, uh, but not in cases of homicides committed with a firearm. It has gone down in terms of number of uh, deaths by strangulation, asphyxiation, or being hit on the head with a candelabra, <laughs> which would lead us to suggest that the Mexican government's security strategy has been to reduce violence by preventing deaths with a uh, candelabra. <laughs> but um, there is another important component to the Peña Nieto strategy for survival, and it is his alliance with the Green Party. El Partido Verde Ecologista, a party whose whole existence today is designed to allow the PRI to remain in power despite the unraveling of the Mexican moment. A Potemkin party without whose support Enrique Peña Nieto would not have won the presidential election and without whose votes it would not be able to win the upcoming midterm election in July. Without an alliance with the Green Party, according to recent polls, the PRI on its own would not be able to obtain more than 30% of the vote nationwide. Therein, the importance of building up the Green Party, 
which many uh, Mexicans unfortunately believe is a better alternative because it sounds politically correct and might have something to do with defending the environment. So how has uh, uh, the government been building up the Green Party? Through a deluge of television spots, ads in cinemas, billboards plastered around the country, a government-sponsored program that allows the party to give out coupons in exchange for medicines. And as someone tweeted to me today, now even packages of tortillas are being handed out with a wrapping that has the Green Party logo on it. <laughs> Thus propelling a Green Party with a black history of corruption. A Green Party that was kicked out of the International Alliance of Green Parties because it supports the death penalty. It defends the life of circus elephants, but not the life of human beings. And sadly, in the face of its often extra-legal strategies, we have witnessed the passivity, if not the complicity, of the electoral authorities. A national electoral institute that wraps the knuckles of the Green Party, but allows it to continue unbridled and unsanctioned, leading to a national electoral institute that has fallen, and Lorenzo Cordoba, the president of the institute, recognizes this, has fallen into a crisis of confidence because it hasn't been able to do what it was created to do, which is defend electoral equality, legality, transparency, and party spending. The majority of the counselors of the institute now behave as simple transmission wires for the PRI and the Green Party. And due to the lack of limits, sanctions, and restraints, the party strategy seems to be working. According to the polls, the Green Party has grown from 4% of the vote two months ago to 11% today, enough to ensure, along with the PRI, a majority in Congress. On the basis of violations to the electoral law and violations of rules designed to assure a level playing field, but the PRI is counting on the weakness of institutions, like the, the National Electoral Institute, to assure an outcome wherein it wins Congress, even if it doesn't have the support of the majority of the Mexican people. All it needs is 41% of the vote obtained in this fashion. It's a cynical strategy, but perhaps a successful one. But even if the PRI manages to retain its hold on power, the widespread sensation that electoral democracy has not resolved the country's problems, but inst instead exacerbated them, persists. Therein our sensation of political orphanhood after Ayotzinapa, where the left also emerged as complicit. Therein our collective anguish when faced with the certainty that public life in Mexico across the ideological spectrum has become, become corrupted. Therein our, our collective disillusionment with the persistence of crony capitalism reinforced by the ongoing conflict of interest scandals in a country where conflict of interest is not a conflict accompanied by the dismay in the face of federal and state governments that refuse to open up relevant information to citizens through the Federal um, Institute for Transparency. The economy doesn't grow as it should, social inequality is on the rise, government officials continue to spend public money without controls, and we are not seeing a comprehensive vision to address these problems in a viable way. <coughs> But worse yet, in this period of democratic deterioration, insecurity has become implanted as a common routine. There it is, the macabre punctuality of death in Ayotzinapa. In the state of Mexico, infamous in the last eight years because of the number of women who have been killed there. The punctuality of death in Michoacán, in Tamaulipas, in Guerrero, and as Ayotzinapa revealed, the Mexican state proves its impotence in the face of organized crime it historically protected. The most indispensable branches of government, courts, prosecutors, the police, evidence their dysfunctionality every day. As Mauricio Merino has argued in his recent book, 
The main challenge for Mexico is not only to save democracy, but to save the state itself, rescue its capacity so that it can guarantee the minimum security Mexicans need to survive. And what about us? What about the Mexicans sitting in this room? The citizens uh, and civil society, what is our role when confronted with this decomposition? Well, we have not been able, capable yet, to design an agenda that dislodges political parties from their complacency. There is a long list of individual and local heroisms that have said that the emperor has no clothes. There have been brave investigations and research carried out by organizations such as Mexicanos Primero and the Mexican Competitiveness Institute and Mexico Evalua and CIDE that are generating methods and knowledge to evaluate the dysfunctionality of Mexican democracy and the degradation of its institutions. There have been student movements, Yo Soy 132, that demand more than the government offers and are not willing to settle for less. But this has been insufficient. The root of deterioration continues because those who have power refuse to share it in a different fashion, because the fundamental actors remain the same, because it now has become clear, and I think I augured this here in Berkeley uh, over two years ago, that a vote for the PRI was a vote for the past. And the only thing that remains is to keep on demanding, keep on treading the root of the insufficient until it becomes sufficient. Take advantage of the social media as an alternative vehicle for democratic action. Demand freedom, conscience, respect. Declare that we are tired of unending violence, the lack of, of respect for our intelligence from institutions such as the Attorney General's office, from the TV networks that pasteurize reality, from political parties that maintain a corrupt and obstinate control over our political life. In other words, transition to active life as citizens in every sphere. Re recover public spaces that have been taken from us. Learn how to be full-time citizens. And I think that that is slowly happening in Mexico today because alongside the collapse of the Mexican moment narrative, another more hopeful and optimistic one has been emerging. But it is not being written by the Mexican government, it is being written by the Mexican people. Those who have taken to the streets and to the internet and who are slowly turning into what dissident artist Ai Weiwei calls obsessive citizens. Those who over the past five months have not stopped protesting, demanding, proposing, pushing. Those who have appropriated for themselves Emily Dickinson's phrase, we ignore our own stature until we stand up. And thousands of Mexicans have been standing up taking to the streets, marching, begging, as film director Alejandro González Iñárritu did the night of the Oscars, that Mexicans finally have the government they deserve. Thousands marching today with the motto, Ya me canse, I've grown tired. Tired of a president whose wife bought a $7 million house, whose title is in the name of a contractor that has made millions in government bids, Tired of a predatory political class that governs the country as if it were its personal fiefdom. Tired of a government that decries that what occurred in Ayotzinapa was not a crime of state. When the actions and omissions that led to the tragedy involved many government entities, including the Attorney General's office, the military, and the police, Tired of atrocities that are not isolated incidents, but rather part of a pattern of government abuse and negligence to address problems of violence and impunity. Thousands who on a daily basis are trying to correct the present and build the future, who are trying to, to become disobedient subjects like those who defied the Communist Party in Eastern Europe, who stood in front of tanks in Tiananmen, who marched along the streets of Selma, Alabama, 
who defied apartheid in Soweto, those who want to turn Ayotzinapa into what Malcolm Gladwell called a tipping point, and who are fueled by the question of how to transform the personal tragedy of 43 families into a collective movement, something that begins to change the way in which we resist and rebel, something, something that many believe is, is impossible, a social movement that is able to go beyond marching in which we become engineers of the imagination to create contextos de exigencia. Contexts in which mobilizations and protests and citizen lobbying can perhaps lead to a national anti-corruption system that is more than window dressing. Uh, to a national transparency law that provides greater access to information when it is too often denied, as is the case with the SAP. Uh, which is the um, entity in charge of collecting taxes, that in the face of a citizen demand by a prominent lawyer, Luis Perez de Acha and Dario Ramirez of Article 19, demanding that the First Lady make her tax returns public, the SAT has refused to do so. So um, a movement that leads to the resignation of those who have been involved in egregious conflict of interest scandals to a national debate over how to regulate the police so that it is able to protect students instead of handing them over to criminal gangs, to the beginning of investigations of corruption that touch the untouchables, such as Arturo Montiel, Carlos Romero de Champs, Emilio Gamboa, Humberto Moreira, Jorge Emilio Gonzalez, better known as El Niño Verde. A social, media, a social movement that demands the immediate public disclosure of the First Lady's tax statements to prove the legality of her income. And the creation of a truth commission regarding Ayotzinapa, supervised by the United Nations, that leads to the obligation by law of public officials to make public their declaración patrimonial, their patrimonial declaration, their tax statements, their possible conflicts of interest, to the end of opaque, non-transparent, discretionary public bids, to the termination of non-accountable government transfers of resources to the teachers' union and the oil workers' union, to a reform of public spending that has become a vehicle for renewed clientelism by the government and opposition parties. In other words, a transition from protest to proposals through concrete policy recommendations that lead to an indispensable institutional renovation. Through a strategy that designs dissent, through civil disobedience, resisting and proposing, and yes, it is easy to believe that nothing we do matters, that ultimately we are not enough to make a difference, to take on the PRI's machinery and society's indifference. We Mexicans have been taught to be the children of fear, of capitulation, of failure. We have been trained to resign ourselves and to submit to the state of things. The habit of resignation has remained among us, not as a faithful companion, but as a yoke. The rope around the neck of a country where government decides and citizens shut up the noose with which the political class approves reforms how it wants, when it wants, and the population bears their effect in silence. And what the post Ayotzinapa, post White House scandal mood reveals is that a growing part of the country no longer wants to remain silent. They do want to resist and create. Los buenos somos más, um, my friend Germán Lez, I used to say. And if we look back at the history of, me of humankind, it is necessary to comprehend that every change, every movement, every social innovation began with a group of friends and colleagues obsessed with an idea that seemed impossible at the time, that Mexico can and should be governed better, and that citizens can elicit truth. An idea that seems impossible in Mexico today, the idea of accountability, the idea that the government will combat corruption instead of harboring it. The idea that democracy serves its citizens and not only its political parties. 
the idea that the police investigates instead of torturing or kidnapping or extorting ideas that, yes, seem impossible in Mexico today. As impossible as the abolition of slavery and gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana and the right to choose and women's suffrage seemed once upon a time. Disobedience in the face of those who viewed these ideas as impossible made history. Disobedience that, as Oscar Wilde wrote, is the original virtue. That is how progress is built, breaking rules that were once considered legal at the time. As in Mexico today, where the unexplained fortune of Raúl Salinas de Gortari, the former president's brother, is legal where rigged bids for government contracts and concessions of public goods are legal, where the Supreme Court years ago, in the case of Lidia Cacho, declared that the violations to her individual rights were not serious, but were legal, where according to a ruling by the Federal Electoral Tribunal several days ago, the PRI's clientless strategy of buying votes through Monex cards is legal where conflict of interest is legal, where the fact that the PRI's president owns 80% of a company that has won numerous bids in the state of Mexico is legal, where government officials do not have to disclose their assets is legal, where the fact that the president and his team has, have incurred in conducts that would be considered unacceptable in a modern democracy to quote an article in The Economist, is legal, where corruption is legal. That is what civil society in Mexico is slowly beginning to realize and combat in order to pull the country out of its morass, not always in the best ways. And the recent violence unleashed by the teachers in Guerrero underscores how much we still need to learn. And there are those, particularly among Mexico's business and political elites, who criticize and oppose citizen mobilization and protest. They decry the chaos it produces. But protest, as I have participated in and experienced of late in Mexico, can be beautiful because it alters the routines of time and space, allowing the impossible to seem possible. It can be beautiful because it comes from a good place, from that stubborn little muscle that is any human heart. That, pl that place that should remind us to protest against the government we don't deserve. And remember Martin Luther King's words among my favorites. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Justice for the 43 murdered students in Ayotzinapa, Justice for the 22 people killed by the military in Tlatlaya. Justice for the 23,270 missing Mexicans. This talk is a tribute to them, a small effort to bend the arc in their direction, in our direction. for questions and answers. So please go ahead, stand up, tell me who you are, and uh, let's begin a conversation. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I would call you my favorite Mexican intellectual, but I think you'd be more proud if I called you my favorite Mexican patriot or citizen. Please don't call me an intellectual. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't refer to myself in that fashion. I, I think, me parece muy mamón. What I took away um, in terms of hope from your talk right now was the power of the citizenry and the segment of the citizenry that I think um, we owe most thanks to right now our investigative journalist, you touched on uh, Carmen Aristegui mm -hmm. um, and her part in the connection between the Casablanca 
and the concessionary agreements with the Chinese firms for the high-speed train. Mm -hmm. um, I truly feel that in the U.S. right now, um, investigative journalism is under attack, um, especially from the state. Um, I wanted to ask you what your take it is. Um, what is the state of Mexico with, with investigative journalists, mm -hmm. um, such as Arias Negui Noticias? Yeah. Um, and how do you feel? Um, are, are they scared right now? Um, is there any sort of um, fear from the state and repercussions that investigative journalists might face? I don't think that Carmen Aristegui will ever feel fear. <laughs> uh, or many others like her, including Lidia Cacho, or Genaro Villamil, or Jorge Cepeda, or all of my colleagues at Proceso, and so many others whose names I forget to mention, but that are my uh, compañeros de viaje. Um, I do think that what they believe is that the space for them to work is closing. Um, I sometimes feel that I live in a parallel universe uh, because I believe that what I read and discuss and know is what everybody else reads and discusses and knows. And it's only when I tweet that I realize that what is part of, part of my political world and knowledge and information is not known by the vast majority of the Mexican people who receive their political information largely from television, 98%. And if you receive your political information largely from television, you will be cut off from a large chunk of Mexican reality that investigative journalists are revealing, but they're doing so in places like Animal Politico and Sin Embargo and La Silla Rota and, and by tweeting. We don't have vast open public spaces. As you know, uh, Mexico is among the five countries where it is most dangerous to be a journalist. The recent case of Moises Sanchez in a small town in Veracruz who published a newspaper that had two pages. It was uh, uh, artesanal. And he was killed because in the, his little newspaper, he accused the municipal president of corruption, and the municipal president had him assassinated. And Moises Sanchez um, encountered this fate because he lived in the provinces, because he didn't have national exposure, because he isn't Carmen Aristegui, who has the protection of her stature. But what she has said to me, and what we frequently discussed, is that these are times to be very careful. And these are times to band together. Um, I've been, I, this, this is uh, an unusual time for me, because over the past year, I have received threats on three occasions, which, it, which had only happened to me before in 2006, when I opposed uh, López Obrador's post-electoral mobilization and reforma, and received my first death threat, uh, paradoxically, from the left. <laughs> um, <laughs> but to be threatened three times this year, and to know that, uh, I mean, Carmen and others, we just assume that all of our communications are intervened, so that's why I'm always very polite to my mother when we talk on the phone. <laughs> um, and, and we know that um, many media outlets are being bought off or pressured or censored. When I said uh, we live, or I live, in a parallel universe, perhaps you think that the White House scandal is on the nightly news every night. You would be severely mistaken. There are only a handful of columnists who refer to this issue anymore. When it appeared on the nightly news, it appeared in a fashion in which Televisa defended the first lady, its former lead star actress, who warranted a $10 million severance package. Um, it did not appear as a news-breaking story that had it happened in the US, had it been discovered that Michelle Obama uh, lived in a $7 million house, uh, but the title was under the name of Halliburton or whatever big contractor that had won government bids in this administration. 
Obama probably by now would have been impeached or there would be serious congressional investigations. That is not the case in Mexico. So when I talk about this resistance and I talk about the, and you mentioned the role of investigative journalists, um, it, these are troubled times because we believe that we're under siege and that the spaces are closing because there is a government that wants to resuscitate the narrative, that wants the page to be turned, that wants the case to be closed, that wants us to stop talking about these issues that have now transcended national borders and appear in the New York Times. So uh, thank you for coming today and for your wonderful uh, words. Um, I had a similar question, so I, I think I'm going to ask more of a personal question. Mm -hmm. So, la mayoría de mi familia está en México, right? Si quieres hablar en español, no hay problema. Ah, pues los dos. Voy a hablar los dos. True story, I never get to do that here. So, um, la mitad de mi familia está en DF y la otra mitad está en Chihuahua. Y mis papás están en México, right? So, familia en Chihuahua ha sido asesinada y de todo lo que ha pasado. Este, mi familia fue la familia de Levarón que organizó en contra del Estado y pidió que los secuestros se reclamaran y que las personas dejaran de pagar. Uh, y la familia en, en DF, tengo un tío que está en la cárcel por política. Entonces, cuando voy a México, estoy con mis primos y lo único que escuchan es música en inglés. Y hablo con ellos y lo único que quieren de hablar es todo menos México. Uh, tenemos conversaciones en familia y they don't want to have anything to do with Mexico. They want to only talk to me about Berkeley, lo que estamos en Estados Unidos y, y desconectarse de ese mundo, ¿no? Y cuando les, les pregunto por qué, por qué hacen eso, por qué están tan desilusionados y cosas, etcétera, 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 que son cosas que han pasado en nuestra familia por muchas generaciones, más, más por el lado de mi mamá, que son indígenas raramos, o uh -huh. sea, pues indígena se la trata como lo peor. Entonces, me dicen... ¿La pregunta cuál es? La, la pregunta, le, 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 le doy ese contexto porque me dicen, el, el, México, el, México, el México que defiendes, el México que, que quieres, el México que amas, no existe, Rubén. Es, es otra realidad. Entonces, para mí es, I'm naturally very optimistic. I'm naturally very forward thinking. I think about solutions, right? So when I talk to them, I think about what's possible. The hope is not there anymore. The love is not there anymore. The belief is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how do you nurture your belief? How do you nurture your love? How do you, how do you stay focused and your vision moving forward of what is possible, what we can build, mm -hmm. um, so that we learn from you and we continue to be that generation that is invested in building? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think um, there, are, there are several and interconnected reasons. One is that I live in a state of permanent indignation <laughs> um, because I live in Mexico. Uh, and there's so much to be indignant about. But I believe that indignation is the source of participatory citizenship. I mean, the National Organization of Women exists because women were angry about not being able to, um, to weigh in in political decisions. Save the Whales existed because someone got angry over uh, the mass killings of whales. Greenpeace exists because someone was angry about how we were devastating the environment. And so many other cases of anger or indignation that lead to transformation. So I think um, there's a part of my, my personality. I'm, my, I'm, my name is Denise Dreser Guerra. <laughs> My friend Consuelo Saizar says that en el nombre llevo el destino. So I'm a, I'm a warrior at heart. And another source of, of, of why I continue this battle, and uh, I, I'm saying this not on a personal note, but with the hope of, uh, of eliciting empathy and, and joining me in this common cause of rescuing the country. Um, I believe in the, op the, the optimism of will over the pessimism of intelligence. <laughs> and uh, the optimism of will 
leads you to believe that the actions, the minute daily actions of people do change the world. It's what Margaret Mead said, it's a famous, famous phrase and I completely believe in it. Um, I recently took all of my students uh, to see Selma and I took them to see it because I think there are so many lessons to be learned there for Mexico. You may not think so. You may think, well, that was a, a battle over racial equality and voting rights. No, it was a battle over civil rights. Those rights that as Mexicans are denied to us every day. So I wanted to, for them to see how you actually get things done. You march and march and march and keep on marching and you strategize and you come up with bills and you legislate and then you stop marching and then you meet with the president and then you march again. It's a, it's a very sophisticated um, form of political change. And I wanted my students to see that that is possible. I mean, in 1955, who would have told you that 10 years later there would have been a Voting Rights Act? Well, all of the things that I aspire to in Mexico uh, that now seem impossible, well, I'm going to make damn sure that they are possible in my lifetime as hard as I can uh, and as consistently as I can. And then there's a third reason as for why I do this, and I don't know how much time you have, but how long do you need or how long can you stay here so that I can tell you all of the reasons why I love Mexico? I frequently say this, las enchiladas suizas de Sanborns a pesar de que no The photographs of Flor Garduño, Eugenia León's voice, the crazy wild Mexican hair of my daughter Julia, the way Mexicans say hello to each other, buenas tardes when they get up onto an elevator, the, the friends that always have time for a tequila, the houses of Manuel Parra, the mangoes on their little wooden stick with chamoy on top of them. <laughs> All of those things. I mean, I even consider pollution in Mexico City a sign of civilization. <laughs> So uh, whenever my, my, uh, my hope wanes, I remember that. And teaching is also a, a great um, injection of adrenaline and a great injection of hope because I see the faces of my students, not all of them. I know that, it, that there will be five uh, who will leave that classroom and I see one of them right there. Uh, <laughs> And I will have hopefully shaken them up and led them to think about the country in a different way and taught them that there's something bigger than themselves out there and that uh, uh, they have to recover the country that was taken from them. El país de uno, que es nuestro. So I'd say the combination of um, personality, genetics, um, love of Mexico, and being a teacher is what fuels what I do, and I hope will continue to fuel it until I'm carried off on a stretcher at age uh, 98. I recently read an article that women who bear twins, as I did, live longer. So that gave me <laughs> great satisfaction and hope. Mi nombre es Federico Fernández, yo he vivido aquí en Estados Unidos desde hace 30 años, así que he visto la situación de México evolucionar en una dirección que es verdaderamente terrible, este, que tiene que, que ver con toda la época que hemos vivido. Creo que este, desapareció del panorama político la perspectiva de una política socialista o de un gobierno de orientación socialista en México, que me parece que quedó enterrado con la destrucción de Sur y su sumergimiento en el, el PRD. Y lo digo porque para mí la cuestión de la lucha tiene que ver con el poder político. Y parece que los partidos políticos de izquierda, los verdaderos partidos políticos de izquierda, han desaparecido del terreno. Este, y mi pregunta para ustedes, ¿cómo ve la, la, la situación en ese terreno? de la construcción de partidos políticos que luchen por el poder 
¿Y cómo ve en este, en este posicionamiento la cuestión de Morena? Um, with, with the democratic transition came alternancia. In other words, uh, in the past you could only vote for the PRI. With the transition, suddenly you could vote for many other parties. The National Action Party, the PRD, the PT, the Green Party. But what we discovered as analysts and citizens with great dismay is that um, the players changed and there were suddenly more players on the field. But the game was the same game, a game of what I call extraction without representation. <laughs> Um, playing on the theme of, of, of the, the, the uh, uh, American Revolution. Remember, to no taxation without representation. Well, what you get in Mexico is extraction without representation in terms of rent seeking and extraction of citizens and of public goods. Uh, very well chronicled in Why Nations Fail that has long sections devoted to Mexico as an example of a rent seeking, oligarchic, extractive <coughs> political system. Um, We failed to change institutions in order to connect political parties with voters. Because up to now, we have, had, we have not had an essential correa de transmisión or an essential element of accountability or an essential incentive for political parties to behave better or as they should, which is re-election. I mean, as you know, Mexico is the only country in the world, along with Costa Rica, that does not have re-election. And it was recently voted and approved and will, I think, begin to be implemented in 2019, but they did it in such a way that's a travesty. You have to actually belong to, you have to stay in the same party in order to be re-elected. It has a series of, of candados and of fine print That means that uh, the whole um, re-election change is not going to bring about what it allegedly sought out to do and what we fought for. And the same thing happened, for example, with citizen candidacies that we also fought for by annulling the vote in 2009. And if you look at the fine print of how to be an independent candidate for anything in Mexico, it's easier to achieve peace in the Middle East than to be an independent candidate in Mexico. Uh, so what this means is that you have a political system um, governed by political elites that are very disconnected from the people they represent. And they don't even have to represent them because what you have is a system of the rotation of basically unaccountable elites. We haven't had Uh, re-election, but we have had a trampoline, where you, you jump from one position to the other. You jump from being in Congress to the Senate and back to Congress. I mean, how many times has Manuel Fabio Beltrones been uh, 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 a congressman or a senator? And so without those base, that, that basic element of accountability, you get a political system where you have parties, but parties that behave more as cartels parties that are very far removed from the interests of those that they should represent. And so I have very little faith in the Mexican party system today. I think it would need tremendous changes beginning with the system of public financing. We have the most expensive democracy in the world. We have a system of public financing that just channels cartloads of money to political parties in every election with zero accountability. And what that means is that there are no incentives to represent, to design better public policies, to promote the public interest. All you have to do is retain your fiefdom. And even the Mexican left has fallen into that trap, sadly. And what you see with the division now between PRD and Morena is that the PRI is going to continue to do what it did for decades, which is divide and conquer. Because you have PRD with 13% of the vote, Morena with 10% of the vote, below the Green Party in terms of electoral preferences. A left that is divided, a left that is cannibalistic, a left that still doesn't know what to do with Andrés Manuel López Obrador, 
a left that led Mexico City to be one of the most interesting liberal, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, far advanced in terms of its protection of basic rights. It's a place where abortion is legal and gay marriage is legal, legal and uh, gay adoption is legal. And this archipelago of, of, of uh, progressiveness in a very conservative country, that is thanks to the PRD. A P the PRD that uh, has kicked out Marcelo Ebrard, <laughs> um, that is plagued by corruption scandals. Um, a, 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 a Morena organization that is offering candidacies or, or filling up candidacies through a system of tombolas. Um, how do you translate that? Lottery. A lottery. Oh, yes, by, by lottery. Uh, and, and today I tweeted, here's a question for Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. If, if uh, allotting candidacies uh, by lottery is such a great democratic instrument, please tell me why no functional consolidated democracy in the Western Hemisphere has ever used lotteries. I mean, if they were great instruments for putting people in candidacies, why haven't we seen them since the French Revolution? Um, so I'm, con I'm very concerned because when you don't have a fun, I mean, the, 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 the void left by, by the left <laughs> uh, means that there for political representation of so many in Mexico who need it. Uh, and who, who would need a left that is social democratic, that believes in markets, but also believes in state intervention, that, um, that, that believes in uh, the middle class and social mobility above justicia social. Uh, a left that doesn't campaign on the basis of por el bien de México primero los pobres, which was polarizing and divisive, and which led the poor to not vote for López Obrador. Uh, so we are missing a left. The left is largely responsible, and it's, it's tragic to say this, for the return of the PRI. Uh, because the left was not able to modernize itself, López Obrador was not able to move to the center of the political spectrum to get himself elected. He was not able to appeal to the middle classes. He was not able to do what Adam Przorsky says is indispensable for a left that actually wants to win elections and get into power, which is domesticate itself and come to terms with capitalism and the market, something that the Mexican left today has not been able to do. Eh, yo nací crecí toda mi vida en México, me mudé aquí cuando tenía 19 años y básicamente la única razón por la que mi papá me dejó mudarme a Estados Unidos y dijo voy a parar su educación es porque está harto del país. Como que viviendo en una cultura muy conformista donde el mexicano promedio como el signo, o sea, no nos importa lo que está pasando y como que ya vivimos en lo mismo, lo mismo, lo mismo y ya sabemos como México nunca va a progresar. Y tú estabas hablando de, de amenazas, de threats. Y en sí... Si las personas como los, ¿cómo se llama? Las personas que tienen un poco más de influencia, que en este caso pueden ser los periodistas, sufren threats. Pero si el mexicano promedio que quiere igual salir, como esos estudiantes de Yotzinapa, que quisieron salir a protestar, ¿qué le pasó? Murieron. Pero, ¿usted cree que algún día este ciclo que existe en México, de que somos conformistas, de que sí nos quejamos, pero somos conformistas y no tenemos, no creamos este, decisiones, decisiones que pueden hacer un cambio, que pueden ser una solución para este problema? O sea, ¿cree que algún día pueda hacer podamos salir de este ciclo vicioso? ¿Y cuál sería como una solución? Sí, bueno, si yo creyera que México es incambiable, no estaría aquí. Y estaría diciendo que el último que se vaya, apague la luz. Uh, yo no creo eso, así como tampoco creo que la cultura define a los mexicanos. No creo que genéticamente seamos propensos al conformismo. Somos conformistas porque la educación pública del de prismo desde hace más de 70 años nos educó para que fuéramos así. ¿De dónde viene el conformismo, la victimización, esta idea de que... Eh, bueno, que mientras yo estoy hablando aquí, los niños mexicanos en las escuelas públicas no están aprendiendo computación o inglés o programación, están aprendiéndose de memoria la fecha de nacimiento de Vicente Guerrero. Están aprendiendo 
a, 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 a ser conformistas, a creer que su historia los define, a creer que México, ching, así es México, y la corrupción es cultural, y como es cultural, tardaremos generaciones en cambiar. Pues tan no creo ese argumento que tú estás aquí, ¿o no? Y, y los millones de mexicanos que han cruzado la frontera no se comportan culturalmente como se comportan en México. Pagan sus impuestos, educan a sus hijos, no golpean a sus esposas, obedecen la ley, se paran en los altos. ¿Y por qué hacen eso? No es porque les cambió el ADN al cruzar la frontera. Es porque encontraron un contexto de incentivos y sanciones institucionales muy distinto. Yo creo que las instituciones cambian cultura, pero aún más que eso, yo soy estructuralista, yo creo que el cambio de estructuras cambia cultura. ¿Por qué los mexicanos han sido educados para el conformismo? Pues porque a la élite política y económica del país extractiva y rentista le conviene que los mexicanos sean así. Y eso va a cambiar cuando eh, algún presidente de México, su obsesión sea educar mexicanos. Su primera obsesión debería ser, bueno, ¿cómo hacemos que la economía crezca? Y la segunda es, todas las noches, ¿cómo hago para educar a los mexicanos para que sean ambiciosos, competitivos, demandantes, críticos, en lugar de que el presidente salga a decir que los críticos son provocadores y desestabilizadores? Bueno, yo me declaro desestabilizadora, porque... Eh, que queremos estabilizar el sistema que tenemos, nos parece que ese sistema está muy bien, pues si estuviera muy bien no habría 10 millones de mexicanos viviendo aquí, como tú. Entonces... Sí. No, yo me tengo que regresar ya en un semestre. Pero, o sea, básicamente yo no quise decir que el conformismo o sea, está en la genética mexicana, porque eso no es cierto. Yo lo que dije es un ciclo vicioso de que somos conformistas por, los mismos, por las mismas amenazas que sufrimos por el gobierno, de que no podemos hacer nada. Entonces, como qué solución? O sea, si ¿sí tiene que haber una revolución sangrienta o algún día puede llegar un presidente que diga como voy a cambiar la una reforma este, educativa. No, no, yo, yo, o... yo para empezar no creo en los líderes providenciales. Ese es el gran problema de México, pensar que va a llegar un presidente que ahora sí... Este sí es el bueno. Este sí nos va a salvar. Como le gritaron a Vicente Fox la noche que ganó la elección en el Ángel de la Independencia. Eh, no nos falles, Vicente. Y se sorprendieron cuando eso ocurrió. Pues las fallas también provienen de la ciudadanía. Los buenos gobiernos eh, provienen, los hacen buenos ciudadanos. Y solo los inconformes lo son. Ah, entonces, yo aplaudo la inconformidad y aplaudo el cuestionamiento y aplaudo la crítica. Y ante las amenazas, ¿aca ¿acaso crees que, que estoy, eh, digo, me ves desvalida, eh, asustada, arrinconada? No, ante las amenazas, y la última fue de Ricardo Salinas Pliego, y le contesté uh, dos cosas. Ese poema Invictus, My head is bloody but now not bowed. Tratarás de intimidarme, pero no lo vas a lograr. Y lo segundo que le contesté es, el día que quieras, eso sí, en un medio público, debato contigo la privatización de Televisión Azteca, el préstamo que recibiste de Raúl Salinas de Gortari y la toma del Canal 40. Pues nunca me contestó. <risa> hay, un, hay un dicho mexicano, el, ¿cómo es? El... el, el, el el valiente es... El, el valiente vive hasta que el cobarde le permite. El poder eh, eh, empuja hasta donde encuentra resistencia. Y hay que educar a los mexicanos para que resistan. Y creo que ya lo están aprendiendo a hacer poco a poco. Y esto no va a ser fácil. O sea, Selma, la película retrata un momento de éxito. Pero antes de ese momento de éxito... Hubo 10 años de cientos de personas reprimidas, golpeadas, desaparecidas. Y tomó sangre, sudor y lágrimas lograr el Voting Rights Act de 1965. Pues va a tomar exactamente lo mismo, el mismo tiempo, si no es que más, lograr la ciudadanía eficaz en México. Uh, one last question, please. Okay.
Uh, yo terminé de ver la película Selma anoche y yo lo que lo que estoy tratando, lo que de, lo que los que me da a entender a usted es de que la manera en la que el gobierno mexicano pueda cambiar es de que usemos ese método de, de Selma. Pero yo me pongo a pensar, muchas vidas han sido perdidas tratando de usar ese método. Estudiantes, familiares, um, las autoridades. Entonces mi pregunta sería, ¿tienen que haber más muertes para que el gobierno mexicano cambie? Aunque nosotros sabemos que es corrupto. Um, Dr. King pudo comunicarse con el presidente y le, le dijo, pues si quieres cambio, tú ya sabes lo que tienes que hacer. Pero en México, si tú tratas de hacer eso, o sea, desapareces y haces lo muerto, so, ¿cuál sería la manera para que podamos cambiar o el método en vez de usar tema porque seguirá causando muchas muertes? Eh, si tuviera que hacer una predicción, diría que sí. Va a haber... Va, Uh, if I had to make a prediction, I'd, I would say yes, probably many more people will get hurt in Mexico before things change. But many more people will continue to get hurt if we don't organize ourselves. Um, one lesson that the civil rights movement taught, has taught, I think, the world, is, and it's reflected in the film, um, even though there were disagreements, even though there were confrontations between Malcolm X and the, most, and the more radical factions, there came a time for unity. And the, there came a time in which, for example, King did something that was enormously intelligent. When he called, after the, uh, after the, the, the televised brutality, when he called everyone of good conscience to go to Selma. And that meant not only blacks, that meant engaging many other members of civil society. And that's what we have failed to do in Mexico. And I expressed hope in this talk. But I'm also very critical of Mexican civil society for its factionalism, for its apathy, for its individual agendas, for its inability to find a common cause, for the lack of leadership um, that, that, uh, that many people have shown focused exclusively on the little area in which they work, instead of understanding that this is a common cause, the construction of citizenship in Mexico. So um, I think that, that, uh, that it is, it is going, it, we are going to go through troubled times in my country before we reach uh, a stage in which citizens are, um, are protected with the basic rights and liberties that people fought for in France hundreds of years ago. Um, I'd say what Mexico needs is not a bloody revolution. I would never call for that. I always say that what Mexico needs is a, and this is very politically incorrect, um, it's a bourgeois revolution. And here I'm referring to Barrington Moore, who uh, coined that famous phrase, no bourgeoisie nor no democracy. And if you don't want to use the word bourgeois because it is politically incorrect, especially in, in Berkeley, <laughs> you are allowed to use uh, the word middle class. What Mexico needs is a revolution of its middle classes. The middle classes that, uh, where does the word bourgeois come from? From the burgos, from the from those areas that began to emerge in the cities of, of Western Europe that went through the Industrial Revolution. The min, uh, to be bourgeois means to be a professional. And this in, involves being an accountant or a banker or a lawyer or an architect. Imagine if all of those banded in Mexico demanding the same thing that the liberal revolutionaries of France demanded. And what, what did they demand? A basic playing field. A, 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 un capitalismo de terreno nivelado de juego. They demanded the eight basic rights that are contained in polyarchy that Robert Dahl describes so well that Mexicans don't even know about. That's the problem. The PRI left us with a legacy of education in which many Mexicans don't even know their rights or they don't know that they have the right to fight for those rights. Um, in my book, I quote Fernando Sabater, who says that the, 
the preferred citizen that, that, that governments like is the idiot. Uh, the one who complacently says, I don't involve myself in politics or the public sphere because my participation wouldn't count for any, anything. Well, idiots govern because other idiots elect them. <laughs> and, <laughs> purpose of my work and that of the, that of many <coughs> other Mexicans, uh, including El Padre Solalinde, who called me last night just to say, are you okay? Um, and I'm not going to bless you because you already are a blessed woman. And I think I'm blessed by the fact that I, I was able to speak with you this afternoon. Many thanks for listening to me.